for psi phenomena, it seems to require um, really jumping into the phenomenon, becoming a part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, the objection is now this uh, takes you out of um, any possibility of rational discourse about it. Um, it takes you away from any context, talking of community, where uh, this can be shared and be a kind of a productive interaction. I don't think it's so um, drastic that you know you have to set aside the senses in order to uh, connect with this extrasensory. Um, because I think that the sense experience, in other words, how we see, how we hear, how we touch and smell and so forth, this um, cannot be separated in reality from this seeing or hearing beyond, you know, what uh, comes to us through our senses or through the, the medium of something, you know. That's a continuum, there's no... There's a gap. continuum, yeah. Um, what I find very interesting in the studies, the laboratory type studies uh, that have been done on psi phenomena are the um, studies of distant viewing. Uh, Russell Targ, I think, has published a great deal of material there. So um, this is an area where um, you're dealing with images places where people are living, you know, it's either the distant viewing of some objects and even some artwork, you know, there will be a photograph or a painting or something like that, um, or a place, you know. Right, well, even like the CIA was interested in this. And the CIA, they say, was very, was interested in it, and the, uh, the Russian KGB was very, very interested in it, and um, I think um, uh, this... Um, um, computer scientist who was also investigating UFOs and other things like that, uh, Jacques Vallée, uh, published a book about the Russians' research in these various mm -hmm. quirky areas. Um, but they seem to be very purposeful and they seem to feel that this might give them some advantage over... Uh, you know, okay, I'm gonna that. Okay. It's just my screen secret. It's, it's I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, but anyway, they, they had perhaps some military uh, ends in view, which also necessarily pollutes the process, the side process of communication and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, why don't you say something to that? Well, the fact that, that uh, governments are willing to pour money and time and effort into researching these things says that there is uh, usefulness, that they could actually derive information about, um, you know, it's unfortunate that it was a military application, but it still, it seems to support the idea that these, these abilities are real, mm -hmm. um, that they could derive information from someone sitting in a, you know, some kind of isolated room in an American city about where weapons in Moscow or, or somewhere in Russia are located and, you know, what the facility looks like mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And um, a lot of this has been declassified, and it's compelling. Mm -hmm. um, now the thing is, how do we how do we understand this? How do we mm -hmm. talk about this mm -hmm. rationally, if or can we? Mm -hmm. um, because in terms of you know what the physical mechanism might be behind this, you can't get one. Because you know, as De Quincey said in that excerpt, um, this is a kind of non-local. Connection. There's no mechanical part bumping against another mechanical part to produce yeah. this effect. Yeah. yeah. Um, at least that we know of. I mean, quantum physics can possibly help us out in the future when we understand it better. Mm -hmm. But um, even you know, quantum physics or quantum mechanics, it's not a mechanics. If if particles are connected non-locally, mm -hmm. um, it's it's something to do with an underlying you know a field. But again, we're using the physicalist mechanistic terms to describe this because that's all we can offer uh, as far as rational discourse goes really mm -hmm. and it does it seems to call us to uh, uh, being open to the possibility that maybe our, our rational discourse as useful as it is in some areas and some for some aspects of, of reality it, it doesn't apply to all and mm -hmm. we can't squeeze 
all of, of our experience into those terms. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not we will be able to develop other terms, I'm not sure. I mean, but what you know, what is language at the, at the end of the day anyway? It's just an ability for people to exchange their inner mm -hmm. uh, experiences in, in a uh, in an abstract way, certainly, but in a way that can be recorded, mm -hmm. so that it can be passed on to you know the technique for for say um, facilitating um, tel uh, telepathy or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. If you can record that in some form of a discourse, it can be taught uh, and passed on to you know mm -hmm. generations after us and. Um, you were saying something earlier this morning about uh, the need for developing a new language, a new mm -hmm. vocabulary, precisely to talk about this area, right. which you know, for which the usual language of science doesn't seem to be that helpful. Right. Um, because we're, you know, we don't want to, uh, as you said, separate these these inner introspective. Um, mental phenomena from our senses mm -hmm. but there's a sense in which they're they're unseen mm -hmm. and you can't touch them you know they don't have weight they don't have mass mm -hmm. they're experiential and so they're very fragile mm -hmm. in that sense you know they don't have this stability where you can measure it mm -hmm. or hold it up before everybody and say look here's the evidence that this is real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it, it it requires more of a Kind of sensitivity, though, an, in, an inner sensitivity, to uh, to even you know come to realize that you have these capabilities. Because, as you said, everybody has this, mm -hmm. but they just don't recognize it because they've never been mm -hmm. um, taught or or they've never been uh, exposed to anything to suggest that they should pay attention to it. That it could possibly be real. Yeah, you know, um, there's this uh, kind of reverse phenomenon of reverse psi, which was already present in the very early 1940s experiments of J.B. Ryan at Duke University, with the famous five cards, mm -hmm. uh, you know, five different symbols, and um, he would test people who came saying that this was all hogwash, that there was nothing here for science to find, because it's impossible for there to be this non-sensory knowledge of, of the universe. You know, it's a mechanical universe, and therefore, you know, it's material. And it's our outer senses are, are given to connect with that, and if we're not using them, we're not getting any information. Well, they would get negative results over and above the statistical possibility or average uh, for hits and misses. And uh, he figured out, you know, it's a very simple formula, you know, what, um, how many sh you should get just by chance. In other words, right, it should be 50-50. 50-50 or whatever. Uh, and yet, here are people were coming in with uh, consistent negative statistics, which means that their mental predisposition was such that they were unconsciously rejecting the input of information that was coming through this other this other means. Mm -hmm. it, of course, you know, this this uh, does not always uh, emerge in every case, but where this has been tried, there has been a certain consistency in these negative psi uh, data. And this is interesting just in itself. It does suggest that we're actually dealing with something very real mm -hmm. and experiential and also common across the board to humans. Right. So even the skeptic, even the debunker, even the person who positively disbelieves in the possibility right. will show some evidence of of, the, of this kind of, of uh, connection beyond the senses. You know, just in general, you know, there's an attitude within science that the knowledge that they produce is is ahistorical, it's, it's beyond politics, beyond anything human. Mm -hmm. But if something like, like this is true, this reverse side, then think about what the attitude of the scientist doing whatever kind of scientific work they're doing is bringing to the table, mm -hmm. influencing the results in you know whatever you know minute way of, of what their experiments produce. Yeah. And this has never been taken into consideration throughout any of science. Mm -hmm. And when we start to become aware of how uh, powerful uh, our our the, you know the deep recesses of our psyches are. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, it changes everything because then your intention, your emotional state, uh, your attitudes, all of these things come into play when, when investigating nature. No longer is it out there apart from you, but it's, mm -hmm. it, it opens it up to, instead of being, you know, you as a distant observer manipulating it from afar, you know, you're participating in it and what you bring to the table influences what you get back. 